Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today we are doing Video Game Book Club. Uh, we're going to be talking about Life is Strange. And I have with me two guests, my buddies Ron and Lucky. Say hi guys. Hey. Hello internet. Hello. Uh, Alright, so we decided to talk about Life is Strange mostly because Ron wanted to, because he beat it recently. And then it was on PlayStation Plus this month. And that's how me and Lucky got it, and we all beat it. And I stream the whole thing. It's also on my channel. Lucky, I know you stream some of it, but I don't know if that's recorded anywhere. And it's not recorded. As I don't have a YouTube channel set up yet. All right. So yeah, that's how we kind of got into this. Um, what do we want to hit? Oh, actually, before we hit on any points, I should say this is going to be a full spoiler discussion. We've played all five episodes. We beat the game. We've made all the big choices. If you're here to hear us talk about this, you know, in kind of a general way, this is, this is not for you. We're going to go all in on the spoilers. We're going to talk about the whole thing and all lots of choices and lots of big gotchas and all that. Uh, so, yeah, do we have a particular point we want to start on or do we just want to kind of feel it oh, out? We might, as well, we might as well go down the list. All right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Which endings did you guys choose and why? Man, I was... I'm not gonna lie. I was a good egg, man. Like, I, like... I was standing on that lighthouse. I saw that storm. I looked at Chloe. I looked at the storm. I looked back at Chloe. I'm like, Chloe, I'm sorry. You gotta go. I was like, I do this with, like, the most heavy of heart, and I gave her the most lesbian of kisses. But, nah. I had to, I had to save the town. Alright, Chris. I have a question for you. I think you should say what you did first. I'll go <laughs> last. I don't want to make this seem unfair. But, okay, full disclosure, I chose to save Arcadia Bay, toss Chloe to the side. But, Chris, my question for you is, um... Why? How do you feel about, how do you feel about our actions of, uh, you know, saving Arcadia Bay and sacrificing Chloe? How do you feel about it being described as being a good egg? Would you uh, it's, have it's some thoughts about I mean, yeah, so... Uh, in case you can't tell, I picked the other ending. I picked to save Chloe, and then that city got destroyed. Uh, you can listen to me right there, you know, I said all this stuff like, oh, it's a heavy decision, gotta think about it, but in the end, fuck your feet! <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I went well, I will say, Chloe. it's like, like, seeing the, like, tornado go over the town, like, while you're holding your hand, it's all like, oh. It was, it was kind of strong, but, like... Well, yeah, no, it's a very heavy decision. Uh, the way I kind of approached it, and the reason why I picked it, was, to me, the whole story was ultimately about choices. Choices were not necessarily good or bad. They were just choices, right? You had to live with them. So, yep. basically, the way I see it, and tell me if you guys agree, no matter which ending you pick, you're basically living with your decision. You either have to well, accept that yeah, you... This... Go ahead. Yeah, well, this is a game, like... Like, in the in the beginning, they basically say this is a game about consequence. And they don't say... They don't use consequence in the frames that most people think about it, where consequence is a bad thing. No, a consequence can be a good or bad thing. And so, basically, this game is all about choice. Right. Um, but, as I said, the... Um, and referring to what Ron said earlier about being a good egg, it's like, it might be more of like a society outlook on things, but, you know, one should not put the needs of one over needs of the many. And that's, you know, especially when their needs are their, you know, their lives. Yeah, no, I'll say that much. It's picking the Save Arcadia Bay ending is definitely a very classical superhero pick. The game oh, yeah, makes a lot of allusion to superhero and superhero fiction and all that stuff. Um, basically, no matter what you do, though, you're, you're dealing with a choice. You either choose to accept that you did, as we say, fuck all time, uh, and save Chloe, and then that's caused this giant storm and all has to do that. Or you have to accept that you're going to go back and you're going to let your best friend, possible love interest, die in order I mean, to guess... keep all those people alive. I guess it depends on how you look at the last choice. Did you see yourself as uh, actively condemning um, Arcadia Bay to a death, or maybe it was just, you know, it's not my problem, I'm going to do nothing, sort of a passive 
uh, you know, you're not murdering them. Well, to me, to explain my, my personal choice, I chose to save Chloe because to me, how I felt doing the story, because it's interactive, so there's obviously some some element of, like, choice and personal subjection there. To me, it felt like the story was about saving Chloe. Like, that's what kicks it off, that's what gives you the, the hook and the impetus for Max to have her powers to go back in time. You're constantly beset by things trying to kill Chloe. You know, we made the jokes about Final Destination a lot. So, to me, it was like... I'm sorry, now I'm just having flashbacks of Chloe shooting herself with a goddamn bumper in the gun. Yeah, Like, fate course. was that out to get her. Yeah, and then five minutes later, <laughs> the train tries to run her over <laughs> in the most cliche thing ever. All because she can't get her boot unstuck. But yeah, no. So, to me, the whole story was about saving Chloe. And in a lot of ways... The game tries to... Because, you know, we talk about the final chapter. There's this whole nightmare sequence. We'll probably get into it deeper because I want to talk about some of like, the psychology. But there's definitely much a very much point of... The nightmare challenges Max to, oh my gosh, you're a horrible person. You're doing all these bad things by screwing around with time. You know, how do you feel about that? And then... Nightmare Chloe comes in and she's like, hey man, stop fucking with Max. And then the game walks you through all your positive interactions with Chloe. It really you know, tease up that ball really good for you to go into that final choice. Which is, I think is interesting because at the same time I feel almost like the the last episode was a little bloaty. Uh, uh, which we'll probably talk about more. But yeah, so my my, um, my choice was basically I'm playing this game to save Chloe. That's the story I've basically been following. So I'm going to take the choice to save Chloe. And I already know from you know, one of the alternate future pasts, the, the storm doesn't necessarily kill everybody. There are people who are still alive, and in that ending, you can see there's a lot of buildings that aren't destroyed. Uh, I live in Florida, and we have hurricanes here, so let me tell you, I have, you know, seen some pictures on the news. Storms can be a lot worse than the one that hit Arcadia Bay. Sure, but even a dozen deaths, is it worth it? Is it? Okay, yeah, and, but, uh... And, and, <laughs> Sorry, um, That's I'm just going to say that uh, uh, throughout the game, conversely, I felt that uh, because it seemed like the universe was out to get Chloe, it seemed it seemed we were never going to get out of it. So presented with the choice in the end, it felt safer actually as well to save Arcadia Bay. Yeah, you know, what if you what if you do choose to save Chloe at the expense of Arcadia Bay, and then later time decides, you know what, I'm just going to keep on coming. Just murder her again. I mean, what do you do? Are you going to spend your entire life re rewinding time and screwing things up and, you know, butterfly effects everywhere? I shrugged. I should probably say that. That's my response. Shrugged. <laughs> Shrug. uh, also, what well, you said that, though, you said, like, the safer choice and the, the things about, like, you know, Chloe trying to get dead. And, you know, you're kind of coming from the perspective that it's it's her fate to die and so you can't fight fate. Me, I'm just Which thinking of the... And that's definitely a theme in the story, but I'm thinking of, uh, you know, Destiny. If you play the first raid and you beat it, because there's a lot of, like, cause and effect and, you know, time shit going on in that, too. The ending message is, Guardians make their own fate. I'm just thinking, yeah. That's me. That's me playing Life is Strange. Guardians make their own fate. See... You know, I like I like the idea of free will, but it seemed like the way the consequences were framed, there was kind of a, I don't know if it was malicious, but there was kind of a will behind things. Like, okay, for example, when you save uh, Chloe's dad, right? Somehow it inexplicably leads to Chloe getting into a car crash, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, no, the universe... I mean, they tried, they tried to illustrate... Very final you know, destination. Like, the universe is trying. They try to illustrate a cause. To they try to illustrate a cause and effect, right? Like, oh, because the dad's alive now, she, he can give her a car, and then she gets in an accident. But you know, the connection's pretty tenuous. Right. I mean, so, I think part tenuous of that, and if we want to talk about like themes and stuff, is that well, actually, honestly, a lot like a lot of superhero fiction, this is one of those stories that doesn't work if Max's life gets better. You know what uh, I'm saying? Yeah. So. Nothing she does until the end can actually fix things, right? Matter. They can't actually matter ultimately because the story has to keep going. Because if it's just, uh, you know, Max and Chloe 
get high on weed and leave Arcadia Bay for L.A. because they can do that if they want. You know that that's not an actual ending. In fact, the game teases you. You think you fixed it all, and then you're <laughs> in San Francisco in the art gallery, and then close on the phone and like, oh my god, time space is trying to kill me again, and you're like, fuck. But yeah, lucky thoughts. Uh, uh, like right now, I'm just kind of, I'm kind of stuck on the idea of the butterfly effect because that's basically what um, it is in chaos theory. It's like I believe the saying goes something akin to a butterfly flapping its wings in whatever part will cause a tornado somewhere else. And in this game, we have that literal representation because, as I'm sure you both remember, one Max, Maxine, Max Factor, whatever Max pun you want to have. Jesus Christ, there's a lot of them. It's um, takes the first fault, names are Maxine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When she takes the picture of that blue butterfly, and I actually want to find out what species of butterfly that is, because it always seems like it's that blue butterfly that always has to be associated with Supernatural. I think the super want... blue butterfly type is the blue morpho, but it might be more specific than that. Uh, Did anyone feel that was a little bit too on the nose? <laughs> well, I mean... I... Yeah, like, why is, a, why is a butterfly in a girl's bathroom... And is the blue morpho even indigenous to the Pacific Northwest? Northwest does even suffer from tornadoes. I mean, I can understand. Well, there's like that. four kinds of uh, a tsunami. Morphos. Maybe I think they're all right. So I just Central pulled it up American. here real quick, and it says the morpho butterflies are over 29 accepted species and 147 accepted subspecies of butterflies in the genus Morpho. They are neotropical, found in mostly South America, Mexico, and Central America. Yeah. So, so. here's the thing I want to say, though, because that rolls right into another point where we're going to make lots of Persona 5 jokes. No, Ron, I did not. Because clearly, that's Max accepting the Velvet Room. Ah, <laughs> oh, God. Honestly, you know, yes. No matter, no matter how much you want this. The last big game I played, B Persona 5, no, that didn't, that didn't bother me at all. I didn't notice at all. Yeah, whatever, there's a blue butterfly. Oh, something magic's gonna happen. It truly is an unjust game. We're not getting a Life is Strange and Persona crossover, however hard you wish it. God, I wish that would work so well. You'd have way more time. But, like, she sees the butterfly, so she sees the butterfly, and all of a sudden she can rewind time, Just at, and just so happens, she gets it when her best friend, who she doesn't know who is her best friend, because Jesus Christ, she went over an image change, Gets shot by resident by resident like tweaker douchebag. Yeah, douchebag. And then rewinds like rewinds time and sets off this whole series of events that like you know accumulates with her. Let's see what what was it? Let's see here. She caused a freak snowfall, solar eclipse, dead Double whales. Moons. Yeah, twin moons. And then Tornado. And, and actually, everyone... now, I don't remember specifically, but doesn't the game actually start with Max having a nightmare about the storm, and then she wakes up in class? Yeah. 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 So that brings an interesting point. This is before she knows she has time powers. Is this... Before she tried on fucking things. Well, yeah. So does that mean the storm was always going to happen? Or could it leave it, it open that there's a stable time loop at the end... Because something I wanted to talk about with the photograph uh, ability is that when Max goes back into a photograph and changes things, once she leaves that moment, the Max that was in that photograph doesn't know that she's basically been time ghosted. That's actually a plot point that she has to go into a photo, tell Chloe, hey, this is actually me from the future. This is a terrible idea. Don't do it. And then in like five minutes, I'm not going to remember we had this conversation, so explain it to me again. I'll get it if you tell me. So if you actually go back through the, the butterfly photo in the end, and then you leave that moment, that is a Max who does not awaken her time powers and doesn't realize any of that stuff happened. Maybe. Oh my god. I actually did not consider that. I think, um... Uh... Big revelations. Well, I mean, well, it's, well, I wouldn't well, it worry makes, about it, it too much because... because Chloe makes a, a major point in the last episode, being like, "Hey, no matter what happens, all that shit we did was real." 
Never mind the fact Chloe has no idea what shit you've been through. Because huh? Max goes through a lot of shit. Jump yeah, so she, don't, she can't really talk. The same shit. She, <laughs> you're out of your element, Chloe. I don't know, nice. it's like, remember, we're about to have a prequel, and if it's, and I'm, I'm hoping, like, someone's gonna have some strange powers. I think they've said that explicitly there's no time rewinding, because the way they phrased it in their official release was, uh, Chloe's mouth gets her into trouble quick, so watch yourself. Okay, so, uh, if the, uh, dream of the, uh, tornado in the beginning of the game represents, uh, there being a stable time loop. Would you guys say it makes you a little more comfortable with the fact that uh, the endings do boil down to two choices? Because it, what it makes it seem like is happening is that uh, she was always going to arrive at those two choices, despite whatever she does. Well, yeah, yeah I think that... the game implies that a little. Because no matter what, in which order they take place, the game starts very quickly with Horrible Storm, and then also Chloe dies, and then you go back in time. So, like, no matter what, she's going to end up at the lighthouse talking to Chloe. Right. That's the whole hook for the game, is you know there's a terrible storm coming. What does it mean? Can you stop it? Why is it here? And Which the game kind of heavily makes... implies that it's because you go back in time that it's causing this huge distortion. I think the game gets a little heavy-handed in Episode 5, where Warren kind of comes out straight out and like, Max, it's you. You're the reason why there's this terrible storm chaos. because you do that time shit, chaos theory, which I think Straight was a drop, little heavy yeah, handed. Chaos theory, but at the same time, it makes sense because the game has to be sure. Like, by the way, you have to understand what we've been saying this entire time is that it's your fault. Feel bad. So, would you say that was uh, the game leaning towards fate being the uh, overriding process in this universe, or? Honestly, Thoughts? I think it's a little hard to to pick one outright interpretation of the game. Um, because it does have a lot of choices, you can kind of see the cause and effect. There's definitely some themes, and we should probably talk about some of them because we want to, rather than keep going back and forth about time travel and chaos theory. But, you know, you can pick either ending. Both have their positives and negatives. Both are a little open-ended, because, obviously, you know, if you don't save Chloe, Chloe dies, and then there's all these people who you know and are familiar with that you kind of assume stuff will happen with them, but you're not sure, you know, you don't know. Like, if you had a positive impact on, like, Victoria's life throughout the actual game, if you're not sure, are you actually going to positively impact Victoria in the, you know, the original timeline? Who knows? And then, obviously, well, I... with, um save Chloe, there's a very big ambiguous on what happened to everybody in Arcadia Bay. Well, speaking of, like, Victorian people, it's, like, one of the main things that, like, you know, made the rewind power so useful is you would talk to someone, you learn something fascinating, rewind, and then, like, you know, just all of a sudden just be able to talk about this new topic, and that person will all of a sudden be enamored with you and want to be friends like you. Like, what happened with all, it happened with all of, like, Victoria's crew with like Daniel all of a sudden like people like because apparently from what I got from the outset with Max Factor is that she was you know very socially withdrawn you know very you know kept to herself but Actually, all of a sudden she gets these powers picked up on later uh, but if you read her school file it says she's in something called an individual education program which is apparently normally reserved for people who have like learning or developmental disabilities so now that could you know that could mean anything from like Max was like dyslexic or whatever the numbers version is or something to like being somewhere on the autism spectrum, but that kind of I think puts it in perspective a little that you know she probably has some stuff going on with her that's not really touched on, which is why she's socially withdrawn all the time. Yeah, but you get these powers and all of a sudden you like you can literally become everybody's friend. Well, yeah, except, it doesn't except that for Nathan. Of... Um. She has social anxiety. Doesn't this power kind of represent what a lot of uh, socially anxious people would like, which is, uh, you know, the opportunity to redo um, any interaction that doesn't pan out the way <laughs> you'd want it to, you said, right? Yo, 
you say that, and it just makes me think of like every time I have a conversation, every like, five minutes later, I go shit. I said this yeah, shit. exactly. So don't you wish no, you could yeah, rewind? No, I have social anxiety. Yes, I would <laughs> love the ability to. Oh, I don't like this conversation anymore. I'm gonna bail out and go back to the beginning. So you know, Max develops this kind of a uh, confidence in herself that maybe was helped along. Well, and that's something all the characters tell By this you rewind. Too. You know, that's another classic case of, of, well, it's kind of show, don't tell. Show, don't tell is a little rough when you're talking about literal dialogue, but, you know, everybody, especially as the game goes on, reacts to Max being like, man, Max, you're so cool lately, or you, you, you're so confident, you're like invincible or something. People are always saying that <laughs> to intense. you. You're intense. Because that's true. Max is going back in time a lot. She sees a lot of bad things happen, and then undoes them, so she definitely gets this kind of air to her that, uh, yeah, whatever. That's terrible, I need to go back in time. Kind of oh. jaded. <laughs> it it also, honestly makes me think of that comic that you linked with Chloe shooting her on the bumper, and Max just has the dead pan face, and Chloe's just like, how many times, Max? How many times? <laughs> well, that comic is you. How many times <laughs> did you have Chloe shoot herself? I will admit five. Okay. I, never See, did. I didn't even know that happened. I didn't shoot the bumper. I shot the gas I tank, shoot. and then it kind of explodes. Yeah, I shot. Like, I was going through the list, and the bumper was on it. First, I didn't know what happened. I'm like, and then, you know, the sc- and the screen did its game over just, you know, straight to gray. And I was like, what happened? So, rewind, watched, did it again. Oh, just my God, I shot sure. myself. Then, twice more, just, I'm all like, just because I, I boondock Saints, I can't believe that just fucking happened. Yeah. Did you, uh, did you guys uh, find the fact that Max can become friends with practically anyone, or at least cordial with them, a little endearing? Kind of like a after-school special? I found well, it actually a that's little classic, off- uh, classic protagonist power. It's a little weird, but then again, when you go into the alternate timeline, if you read like alternate Max's journal, and there's the fact that She's in the Vortex Club, and she's buddy-buddy with Victoria. You know, she smokes weed with Victoria in the girls' bathroom. You know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's like, and it seemed like Victoria was kind of a different person, too. She didn't seem like... I don't know, she didn't seem, like, as mean. But on the same time, she would seem to be, like, not doing with well as, like, people like Alyssa. Yeah. So... There's, there's some mean girls going on. But yeah, so... I think the the game tries to present this to you. This is another classic example of show, don't tell. They present to you this idea that all Max really needs to actually be, you know, cool and tight with people is to, you know, listen to them, have the confidence to actually talk to them, and maybe just a little bit of the ability to go back in time so she can learn something. Excuse me, when people call her an asshole, and then she can be like, well, I don't want to feel like an asshole anymore. Let me redo that. Because, boy, let me tell you, there were a lot of times when I made major choices or dialogue trees, and I'm like, well, now I feel like an asshole. Let's rewind that. Oh, shit, this makes me feel like an asshole, too. I'm going to rewind that and do that the other way. So, I think we've talked a lot about the, like, the rewinding. We've talked a little bit about the characters. Uh, Lucky, I know there's something you talked about a lot that, you know, because we were talking about Victoria... There's definitely a theme of this game of Shades of Grey, right? Like, you meet a lot of these characters, they're terrible to you, you think to yourself, oh, this is it, this is the blood feud for life, and then, like, two episodes later, you learn something about them, and you're like, oh, you're actually not, well, you're kind of terrible, but you're not as terrible as I thought, so we could be friends, or something, I guess. Yeah, it seemed like that was the case for everyone, including Nathan, who, uh, the last thing he does before he dies is he finds remorse, right? I mean, the yeah. only person that was irre- uh, irrevocably reprehensible was, uh, was his face, Jefferson, Jefferson. the uh, main antagonist. And that's kind of the point uh, of him, I think, because he's, you know, a psycho serial killer guy, is that, you know, he's, once you get him to motive rant, because you totally make him monologue at a couple points, once you get him to monologue... All right, so there was a brief technical difficulties there. My bad. That'll stay in, because people will want to know why this is a sudden stop in my thought process. But what I was in the middle of saying was, Mr. Jefferson is the only, like, bad all-the-time character, because you can get him to monologue in the game, 
and it really it's it's a proper villain monologue you challenge him to tell you why he does all this and he is just nuts if I it's remember gonna... correctly, he is, like, all too happy to tell you to, like, oh, yeah, classic villain, classic villain, let me tell you my secrets, all want the camera in his hand. Yeah, for, uh, for better or worse, you know, the rest of the characters are kind of more believable, they all have, you know, layers and whatnot, then with Mr. Jefferson, he ascends to this kind of mythical proportions of assholery, you know? <laughs> Well, becomes more fiction than everyone else. Well, I don't know. Well, psychopathy isn't as common as fiction sometimes makes it seem. There are people who have like real full blown disorders and are either non functional or partially functioning people who do really fucked up stuff. That's How okay you? for like a you know kind of a murder mystery kind of story. You know, you we already have supernatural elements. I think it's okay that it jumps straight to, oh, by the way, Mr. Jefferson is a freaky photograph serial killer. Well, actually, like, that was the, that was the interesting thing, is, like, he, before, like, what happened with, uh, Rachel, no one was killed, I don't think. Everyone just got freaking date rape drug. Yeah, because, uh... A whole bunch of pictures, and then he just, like, dropped them off somewhere, and they're all like, what the fuck happened to me? because, yeah, uh... Nathan, Nathan did right. the, uh, um, overdose... Up. Nathan fucked up and killed Rachel. Right. Well, and I, Nathan, I don't know. I think there's some implication that there's some murder going on, and then people just never find the bodies. No, no, because that's the thing. Remember, they they noted that there hasn't been many missing person cases in Arcadia Bay. That was one of the points they pulled that's up. That's true. Though I don't know how long he's been in Arcadia Bay. So, like, take for example, Kate. Right? She's the. Uh, oh she's God. The, uh, typic- she's a typical resolution of a Jefferson true. kidnapping. You know. Drugs. She just dies Let after him. her. He takes a picture of her in her purity moment, and then when, then the purity is gone, and she just dies, and he's okay with that. Yeah, I guess I don't know. I got the implication that there was possibly some freakier stuff going on, and quite frankly, he is way too eager to kill everyone involved to have not killed people before. Like, even if you're under pressure, you don't suddenly flip the switch to. Oh boy, you're gonna go killing again. <laughs> I mean, because think about it. In that bad ending, yeah. he tags he tags Chloe in the yeah. junkyard. He tags Nathan probably before that because he used Nathan's phone to fake you out. He's okay killing Victoria, and he's planning to kill Max, and he will kill David if you don't time shit your way well, out. Well, this is how I thought of it. Um, you know. He's a, you know, a sociopath, but he's rational enough to not kill because that brings more attention. But now that things are going, you know, complete, completely opposite direction of what he intended, he needs to start making these concessions and cleaning shit up. And he, he's very uh, capable of doing that because, you know, he's a sociopath. <laughs> yeah. It's turning the switch. But I, that's, that's very interesting to see that that's, that's how that comes out because the characters you think are the villains in the beginning, like David, Kurt, okay... Yeah. He's got a problem, but he's... You he know, cares. There's, like, PTSD stuff going on. Like, it's completely reasonable why he's on edge all the time and has problems with all this stuff going on because he's been through some shit. Frank. Frank. Victoria Frank. is... Yeah, Frank, Frank is my favorite person. Like, Frank's not a... Frank I wouldn't say you would dog. say he's the villain from right away because... I mean, he has a shit. dog, and the dog... Yeah. Like, Chris, I, I didn't see your episode 5, but did you sit down in the cafe during the storm and have Pompidou come rest his head on you? Oh, no. Wait, what? I no, like, do don't worry. I gotta go back and do collection mode on all the episodes, so I'll make sure to hit that up. Yeah, basically during um, the storm, when you make it to the diner, or, like when you talk to Warren, he's all like chaos theory. There's one of those things where you can sit down, and when you sit down, Pompadou, if you you know kept him good and healthy, like you should, otherwise you're a fucking monster. A yeah, who throws a bone traffic? <laughs> <laughs> who comes over? Who comes over and rests his head on you while you have your thoughts? I'm all like. Yes, this is catharsis. Yeah, I, I didn't do that because I wasn't in an introspective mood at that point. I was like, <laughs> Shit's I, going down. Max's thoughts on this is, shit's fucked, Captain. Or is the joke <laughs> that I kept making, shit's fucked, Mr. President. Yeah, speaking of introspection, you know, she finds the worst times to be <laughs> introspective, this Max character. The worst times. Max hipster. Max. Uh, but no, like, I didn't necessarily think that Frank is an obvious villain because he doesn't come until, like, episode two. I'm talking about the people who, in, like, 
episode one, you're like, oh shit, these people are terrible. You know, I don't know. David, I felt like David, uh, Victoria. Uh, well, because David is is harshing your buzz a lot. Like he's he's up all in, in Kate's business. He wears his aggression. Like he wears his aggression on his sleeve. So it, I, I didn't see him being the big bad. Yeah, I mean, but it's also I like believe it or not, I would also throw the principal in that. That's because, okay. He was a little grim. Well, yeah, because I actually did both of those answers you can give to the principal. Yeah. Uh, guess what? You're fucked like, way. And apparently, like, like as you discovered, if you tell the principal about the gun and then follow up with that, yeah, you get Nathan expelled, but when you're, like, looking at it, you're just like, uh, I don't know if this guy believes me. Oh, fun fact, if you try to blame Nathan without telling him before, you get suspended. Like, Maxine gets suspended. Yeah. Oh, what? Yeah. Which makes sense, because he thinks you're being suspicious, and then you try to throw the blame on somebody completely different. The principal's another one of those characters where it's like, oh, okay, sure, you have a drinking problem, but you're also a fairly rational, normal actor in this situation. Like, you know, Although, Prescott's have you by the balls. He but does enable going Prescott's school. because of good family money. Oh, boy. That family well, you know, money. Like, did, did you remember finding the email about them taking down the Prescott emblem in the library? And then the Prescott's being all like, if you don't put our emblem back right where the fuck it was, we're taking all our money. And it's just like, oh. Yeah, I think that the <laughs> Nathan's dad is clearly the, the true hidden villain, because it's all his <laughs> fault for being a rich douchebag who fucked Nathan up and all that other stuff. Too bad we never meet him. No, you never meet him. Listen, you hey, can't hey, solve hey. all your problems. But if you do what I did and you choose the well, ending where Arcadia Bay gets fucked, he's totally out of money because all the real estate's shot. Yeah! Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Silver linings. I'm sorry, I'm just thinking, like, because apparently the, like, it all comes back to the Prescott's, because apparently, like, in one of the, like, I think it was in the old barn, you find the news article saying that the Prescott's brought the bomb shelter boom to Arcadia Bay. So who knows how many fucking dark rooms there are in Arcadia Bay. Yeah, no, there's well, all every dark room needs Jefferson to take there's care also, of it, right? We never so. see one, but obviously there's a Squatch problem out there, okay? <laughs> the only other character I think is a good example of that, like, you know, that gray area who you who's clearly an antagonist from the start is Nathan. Where me personally, yeah, Nathan, the more and more we find out about Nathan, I'm like, oh, Nathan's not evil. He's just crazy, and he's off his meds, or he's on his meds too much. Because no matter where you go with him, it's always like, oh, gee, here's a giant dose of anti psych meds, you know, in his locker, in his dorm room, all that other stuff. He's clearly not a well balanced individual. Right. Yeah, you find letters from this therapist, and his dad's unwillingness to have better treatment found for him. Yeah. Like, that's... apparently his dad yeah. is like, his dad's all like, here's your meds, get the fuck away from me, don't embarrass me. Yeah. And then he just goes from there, and it's Nathan's like, what do I do now? He finds a surrogate father in uh, Jefferson. Mr. Jefferson. Who's, a huge Who's all like, yeah, I totally kidnap girls and take pictures on the modern drug. Who is also very callous with Nathan, as proven the game. Nathan doesn't get any breaks. No. No, Nathan's one of those. Oh god, like is there is there a trope name for that? For it's like all I wanted was love or something. Yeah, is there's he a ruby. That. That's He's definitely an archetype. Yeah. Uh, you know, the well done son guy. I think is the most prominent trope. Where you're yeah, like, it's like you yeah, just he, want your dad he, to say, "Well done, son." Yeah, that's all he wants. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um. So that's a little bit about the characters. Do we want to talk about any of the characters in particular? We talked a lot about Max and her introspection before bouncing back and forth. Oh, man. Do we Warren, need to talk about like, Chloe? I'm no, I'm going to talk about Warren and how hard I fucking friend-zoned him. Everybody like, did. Actually, no, that's wrong. Man. I checked the global stats. Holy shit. There was like 70% of people chose to kiss Warren, despite the fact that most of the time it's like 50-50 to leaning towards not doing anything to help Warren, like, not agreeing to go with him to the drive-in and stuff like that. Did you, uh, did you try the kiss, though? It seems very Princess Leia-ish, you know, at the end of, uh, no, I didn't. Of course I didn't. A New Hope. It was I very, uh, Chloe. very platonic, but then I never know, because the journals reflect a different kind of feeling. Apparently, well, also, uh, Warren is very much, uh, gunning for Max the entire game. Unless it's like, you like, kiss almost, Chloe and then she talks to Warren and then he's kind of like, oh, I see how it is. Okay, good luck. 
Yeah, and then I like I start like I like try like I'm seriously playing this game. I have a Warren figure in one hand. I have a Brooke figure in the other hand. I'm like now, kid. Oh yeah, no, I was like that all the time too. I was like, for the love of God, Warren, why don't you see this? Also, like I said, from the moment I met Brooke, I was like, I can't tell if this girl likes me and she's just nerdy and awful about communicating it. Or that she hates me and she's just too smart and polite to let me know to my face like Victoria would. No, I definitely knew she was spiteful. <laughs> Come on, dog. <laughs> no, I got it. Yeah, but you, you don't find out why until you, later, I mean, it doesn't though. really click, you know, the, the moment I heard that Warren had invited her to the, uh... The drive through Oh, yeah, no. I, whatever you know, I, I, I figured out in episode two when she's lurking in the science lab and she and you tell her that, oh, hey, Warren has to be to... Or Warren, does it look like Warren's working on his experiment? She's like... Oh yeah, it's too bad he didn't ask me. I'm real smart. And then you're uh, like, oh yeah, no, I'm super dumb. I can't help it all with this. I don't know why you wouldn't ask you. Super shade. And then it, it clicked to me. I'm like, oh, she wants to. She likes Warren, and I'm in the way. Oops. And I tried real. All hard right, so this is why this is what I want. This is want what I want for Life is Strange Two. I want Warren as the pro tag, and I want Brooke to be the sidekick, and I want them to go on a super science nerdy adventure in Arcadia Bay, finding All some right. weird science. You know, I tried... I just tried being a good friend. You know, when I said yes to the movies, I didn't want him to take it the wrong way. But, took but I guess the game, <laughs> the game took it the wrong way. <laughs> like, well, to honestly, be fair, I'm quite surprised because I know the Kiss Warren option only appears you, you've done a certain amount of positive things for him. Oh, I and see. And I was like... Gee, did I actually do enough that the game would calculate this variable? Because I don't think I did. Because I said, like, no, I don't want to go to the movies. No, sorry, Warren, I'm busy. I mean, I helped him out with science, because that would be a real jerk if I just oh. exploded on him. But I didn't, like, fix his grade. Oh, did you turn his A- minus into an A+. plus? No, I didn't do that. I did. No. <laughs> Basically, um, like, after Did he you... earn that? I don't huh? Think... Did he earn it? I don't think so. <laughs> Well, no, you know, I'm helping Frank because I was like, I was in the high school. I was already committing a bunch of trespassing and burglary. Why not a little bit of what would it be? No, yes, so you, you breaking time. illegally break. blow up the door and then rewind time so you didn't do it. Breaking that. time? Setting off bombs? Listen, okay. no. There's, there's no it's time police, okay? Out of, out of <laughs> Otherwise, we would have been totally caught <laughs> right away. There is not a time police. Line. Because Max is terrible at this stuff. <laughs> oh gee, Chloe shot herself. Better go back in time. No, oh, gee, I don't again. like that. Uh, I don't like what that person said to me. I'm gonna rewind time and do something else. Oh gee, you know what the Chloe made me, uh, not Chloe. Kate made me feel real bad that I took that picture of her and David that totally comes up later as possible evidence, and she was real mean to me. I'm gonna rewind time and confront him. Oh man, Kate! Like honestly, I feel like the Kate, like what was it like the first three episodes of Bombing Kate were like super fucking intense because when it culminates in all in that final moment when she's on the roof and you like start listing all the things that help you, I'm like, oh thank God! Yeah, no, oh, okay. that's that's very clearly the game is telling you, hey, your choice matters because boo, here it is. You can't go back in time unless you're like me, and then you save scum. Because uh, <laughs> I fucked it up. There was something kind of weird. Super small nitpick, and I noticed in my playthrough and yours as well, Chris. Uh, you know, during the uh, conversation on the roof, it's kind of doesn't flow very well, does it? Oh, well, no, yeah, no. It's like it's, well, it, it's, it seems like you know you're talking. You're talking. There's now, quite a few like conversations reaching. in this game because it is a choice game where it will reflect on your choices back to back. So obviously, you can see the cuts where they had to put a stop so they can insert whatever the appropriate dialogue in here is in there. Like, imagine one's frustration. You know, imagine one's frustration. It's going well, and then she just turns on, turns on the. Uh, I'm gonna jump off, switch again. Well, just... yeah, it was it was totally a Deus Ex like um, social confrontation. I, like, I made that joke. I think in my stream, I was like, "Oh, geez, where's my Casey mod? <laughs> where's my bar? I really need this right okay. now. I need my hood." Because that's totally how that. It's totally how that went, right? Like, there were the obvious cuts, and then there was, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. if you did a good option, her expression would go up, her next line would be good, and then it stops, and she goes back to a neutral position as she brings up her next point, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Like, come tumbling down. What happens, quick. like, I think, I'm pretty sure there was, like, oh, yeah, with Frank. Yeah, yeah Frank, Frank is another example. 
Oh, yeah. No, that I love because you can rewind time. And you probably will fuck it up and then you rewind time and you're like, Okay, Chloe, let me tell you. This isn't gonna go well. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, Chris. I, I, I had to make you do it just because I think it's like, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was, I was it's gonna do it anyway moments. because it's probably very hard to do that clean. No, I fucked that up yeah. repeatedly. So uh, she got she got eviscerated by a dog multiple times. <laughs> pretty bad. Oh, I bet. Oh, I bet. If Chloe didn't have the gun, Pompa Dude might have got her. Holy shit! Yeah. Because yeah. I know there, I know there's an option in like one of the previous episodes, like in the RV, where you can leave the little revolver in Frank's. Um, oh yeah, no, because it's possible for Frank to take the gun and keep it, and then if you, I think the way it works is because the dorm happens before that, the boys' dorm. You can take Nathan's gun, and then Chloe has a gun anyway. And then if yeah, you missed, go into the RV, you get a gun back no matter what. But yeah, honestly so, though, she shouldn't have a gun. Not without trigger discipline. Yeah, she's bad. At it. All right, shall we move on to the next topic? Yeah, I think we. Well, actually, that's what I was about to say. There's one character we've kind of danced around. Do we want to talk about Chloe specifically? Uh, okay, she's not bad. I mean, she's like everybody else. But I'm not that sure I was convincing. The game kind of like... makes your your cross links a little stronger. It kind of hits you pretty hard with. By the way, close your childhood friends, but she's in a bad spot. So it, I think at times, like seriously, question: How many drugs did All she right. buy from Frank to rack up like several thousand dollars? <laughs> Actually, that's a good question. We have access to Frank's ledger. We sh I should have double checked that. I was trying to look out for Chloe's like fake name, but I didn't see it a lot. Yeah, she, so, she seems to have an unlimited supply of weed, so. Probably grows it in a little uh, farm in his RV closet. No, I but, mean uh, her. Chloe always seems to have, you know, a joint oh, when she needs one. Yeah. Because well, she obviously. smokes a lot. That's another thing to think about Chloe. Is she, is, she is a substance she's abuser. She's probably always high. Times. That's why she's always shooting herself. On accident. She, she's fucking high. Most she explicitly right. mentions, I think, all the times you wake up in her room... I gotta wake and Time make. to wake and make. Yeah. yeah. She smokes in the afternoon when you get back to de-stress. She drinks at the junkyard before she shoots the gun. Oh, that was a great Which idea. is why you need to aim for her, probably. But, but um... Yeah. yeah, you know, she's great. But I'm yeah. not sure the game endeared her enough to me for me to sacrifice Arcadia Bay for her. I mean, the, yeah. But I understand that if you were, like, trying to put yourself in Max's shoes, which is kind of weird in this game, because you're, you're trying to be Max, but you're also supposed to feel what Max feels. I don't know. Yeah. Just well, yeah, you're because you can rewind time, more. you get a very meta perspective on this whole thing, I think. Yeah. And you, you pick dialogue options for Max, but you don't necessarily, like, you get a lot of look at what Come Max back. thinks and feels about stuff, and you get to pick what she does, and obviously you can go back in time, but at the same time, there is a certain amount of disconnect. Because there's very much a... Yeah, it's like, Max... If I don't like what happens, I can go back and redo this. And I... The game in the end in the nightmare, like, makes Max question herself. Like, she questions, am I doing the right thing, or am I just, you know, abusing my power and people to go back in time all the time? But she doesn't necessarily express that a lot, I think. Maybe if I sat down on more things. Yeah, she I mean, kind maybe of, she's... like... Like, for all her introspection, like, if she's not in introspection mode, she kind of is just in the moment. Right? Whoop, fuck that up. Go back. I mean, that's kind of natural, too, right? You put off your uh, doubts and fears until mm -hmm. the very end when they're about to collapse upon you. So, uh... I don't know. I don't think there's anything wrong with sacrificing Arcadia Bay, but, uh... <laughs> I don't know. Well, as I said, like, even with sacrificing Chloe, I was, like, shipping Max and Chloe, like, Pretty damn hard. Like when they came out, it's like I double dare you to kiss me. I'm all like, I'm gonna smash this button so fucking hard. Uh, yeah, no. Damn. I mean, <laughs> I just there, I just there were several there. jokes that I made <laughs> all the time throughout my playthrough. Probably the most common recurring one was either subtle or phrasing in response <laughs> to uh, Chloe and Max's interactions because it's not subtle and her phrasing is terrible. It's like take a shot anytime something subtle happens or you hear the word hella. You'd be dead. Yes, you would. Oh, yeah. Speaking of teenage slang. Oh, my God. 
segue into... Oh my into god, so even in... The, next the game came topic. out in 2015, but it was set in 2013. Yep. But even so... Yep. Even so, I don't think such anyone Such an ironic like use that. of hell. No, no, actually, no, here's I the thing. It's like, they're 18. So, they're like, they're like, they were born in the 90s. So, they had, like, the 90s and the aughts. And I'm like, I'm looking at that, I'm like, what the hell is Shaka Bra? Yeah, I don't know. Okay, apparently that was a very uh, retro thing to say. I looked it up. It's ridiculous. Really? <laughs> yeah, it's a thing. What but uh, regarding Hella, evidently, uh, a lot of my NorCal friends tend to use it. So maybe it's maybe it's just regional. It could and be it just happens to, yeah, it just, just, it just happens to not be in any of the regions we live in. Is it a well, Yeah, as I said, like I live in the Pacific Northwest. Like I can go to visit Portland and have a decent time. I have never heard the word hella. Like and like me Ron, Ron, um me and you, we have we have West Coast accents. Like you might not realize that, so we say things like the same thing and like hella yeah, is cold. definitely not one of them. <laughs> Hella is not a West Coast thing. It's not. No. It's not a thing down here. Uh, I live in. Well, I live in Central Florida. Not a commonality, no. So I can sound real Southern if I like. I use y'all, but that's the okay drawl. because English has no good second person plural for you. Okay. Well, it's not the real the that, thing. Um, the word that bothered me the most was really a uh, wowzers. Yeah, that came. Okay, up you know, yeah. Shaka Brahma, maybe in the back of my mind, I think I've heard it before. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, you can that just put that up to up. Chloe's weird punk thing that she's got going on because I'm not part of that scene. So, uh-huh. wait, wasn't Chuck Bra used by Max to? Yeah, she, yeah, Max. I used think it she when uses it though, <laughs> like to echo Chloe because Chloe definitely says it unironically at some point. All right, so no, according to, oh, go ahead. Yeah, um, I remember Max used it when she had dressed in Rachel's clothes. And Chloe had said, we'll make a thrasher out of you yet. And she said something, something, shaka bra. And then Chloe was like, maybe not. Yeah. So that clearly implies to me that it's something that's kind of in Chloe's parlance, but it's probably a little outdated. It's a... Uh... Because Ma- Max is, one, Max is a huge hipster. But two, she yeah. she also has dated references. She says, are you cereal? And Chloe is like, did you just say that? <laughs> okay. According to Urban Dictionary, shaka bra means to hang loose. Originating from Hawaii. Oh, it's and surfer bro. lingo. Surfer. See, surfer lingo doesn't quite mesh with punk. No. Yeah, it doesn't. But Chloe is a skater girl. Bruh. Right? You know, I don't Lancer, think she actually right? skates, but she has some <laughs> skater magazines around. And then we have the sweet uh, hey, tree flips, again? nose grinds. Can you do a, can you do a triple, a, no, what was it? A, God, what were the tricks? They were really stupid. Let's not try to bring And then you rewind time and you're right. like, sure, I love uh, tree flips and nose grinds. Oh, tree flips. There we go. Yeah. Can you do a tree flip? And then the kid no. falls over, hits his balls, and you take a picture. Yep. Well, as I said, like, on Chloe's defense, this is the Pacific Northwest. Like, like Seattle was the birthplace of the grunge punk scene. So, like, you know, the dyed hair, piercings, flannel, red the shirt. Weed. Like, yeah, that was very much a thing. The weed, that was very much a thing here, like, mid-90s. And so, and, like, I don't see it much as much nowadays, unless you, like, go, like, deep Seattle and you're going to all the underground shows. Yeah. But it's, like, yeah. true. so, but like, Arcadia yeah, that Bay is, is punk like, culture around here. Arcadia Bay's a little, like, rural or suburban, so you can easily see it as something that, yeah. like, as a kid, Chloe would have seen this kind of leech out of the urban centers as what cool punk people do there's enough of a scene left that there's like bands and stuff that maybe come through or, or people grow up on this music so that's what they do in their garage band kind of shit and that's why she's all yeah a little retro the hella thing i don't think anybody understands but yeah it's, it's become a meme so <laughs> yeah and as i said i think i think the best line to describe chloe and like and where she is and how she is is you know the classic rebel without a cause because it's like that's what she is. She's basically stuck in this little podunk town, the giant dead with a stepdad who she can't stand. Right. She can't understand her. him, and she doesn't want to understand him because she misses her real dad because he's dead. Yeah. So she's basically trying to lash. She's trying to lash out in whatever way she can. But guess what? She's in rural fucking Oregon. She can't do much. And guess what? It's the small town problem. Shit follows you wherever you go. The whole the cops don't know who Chloe is. She can't escape her drug dealer because 
he's always in the town. She live no, she practically lives next door to the guy. True. Her he mom works at the diner where he goes for breakfast and lunch and dinner every day, you know. <laughs> like, like, let's, not, let's not even talk about, like, the food choices. I'm like, real talk, that was some hard fucking choices. I'm like, oh, God. Oh, yeah, no. There were some rough. <laughs> what like, do I want to vicariously waffles? eat right now? <laughs> wakey, wakey, Thank eggs you. and bakey, man. That was an actual wake line. That's good, yeah. Well, I said wake that before. And bake, it happened eggs and bake. That's what I was thinking. Yes. Eggs and bakey. And then, so, like, yeah, Rebel Without... So, like, yeah, Chloe's the Rebel Without a Cause, and I think it's, like, perfectly reflected in her manner and dress. She's basically a punk in a place where there are where there are none. I think, you know, I think uh, liking her really depends on whether you found her authentic or perhaps a poser as a... Uh, well, not necessarily a poser, but, you know, something else. Well, I don't know how old... The Ashton general purchase, uh, she's life way older than eighteen. It was way older than eighteen two years ago. I mean, I'm just speak, old, but you know what I mean. Speak so. through the entire life is strange community. You know, some folks don't like Chloe, and I guess it might just because I might be because she seems like a uh, she's trying too hard. Yeah, there's a little bit. There's a little but, bit of concern to try hard. There's also the fact that the, I mean, like I said, we talked about. You know, she doesn't want to listen to anybody, not even yeah. Max. She but I think to her credit, she has classical. If she was the protagonist, and I think we'll see this when the prequel comes out, if she was the protagonist, people would be fine with her because she's just saying the stuff you want to say. You know, fuck you, man, fuck the police, that kind of stuff. As a, I think to her credit... As a protagonist, she would be very right. appealing, I think, because she does the stuff that we want to do as, like, a rebel, right? If you were in her shoes, you'd do a lot of the stuff she does, but when you're outside her shoes, as Max, who has to clean up after her, you're thinking to yourself, God, Chloe, just shut up for five minutes... Stop picking fights. God damn it. Credit, though. She, uh, like, like, really, like, she really comes through in the end. Oh, yeah, no. You know, prioritizes the safety of others. And the, she the was game willing game, to sacrifice herself. That. We've talked about before about how in the Nightmare sequence, you know, Nightmare Chloe comes into the diner, tells off Nightmare Max, and then the game gives you the montage of literally every moment you've, every positive moment you've had with Chloe since the game began, including the alternate timeline Chloe. So, oh, yeah. God, alternate timeline, Chloe. That was heavy. That was heavy. Oh, okay, man, I, was, pull yeah, pull that I couldn't pull it. I couldn't pull it. I knew that was going to be rough. That's why I said before I started that episode, I'm like, I hope to God somebody's here with me because I don't know if I can do this on my own. This is, this is going to be tight. And it was. And then you and you were like, I just, and I, I remember like while you were streaming, you were like so distinctly uncomfortable with everything. It's like, and you were just like, can I leave now? Yes, Are we no, done? I was tense the entire time because I. I got the feeling where that was going before it happened. I'm like, this is not a good place to be for anybody. I don't want to be here. Max doesn't want to be here. Chloe literally doesn't want to be here. And then Chloe's like, I want to leave. And I'm like, all right, Chloe, I'm going to do you solid. I'm going to help you out, make you feel better about your life. And I'm going to go back in time, and I'm going to unfuck this. How'd you guys uh, handle that last choice? Which choice? choice? I give it a more playing Dr. Gorkian. Oh, man. Again, that's kind of I I literally said, I don't know. I was like, I can't do it, Chloe. Thing. It's like, I just... Chloe's like, man, it really sucks to be. I'm going to die anyway. Could you do me a favor and at least make it peaceful? And I'm like, uh, okay. <laughs> I wanted to answer, I don't know. I, but I, I knew I'm like, I I it's not an actual answer, though. Well, when, what happens then you... when you say I don't know? You, it's basically a delay. You talk a little bit more, then you just then you have only two choices. That's fair. I probably could have picked that better. So it's, it's, literally a, it's literally a delay tactic. It's all like, you have to make the choice. There is no, there is no lucky escape button. It's kind of cool though, right? Because um, the last choice in the game kind of reflects this euthanization choice. I mean, it kind of does, but at the same time, I, I think kind differently of, for different but, reasons, uh, though. But anyway, yeah, let's not necessarily rehash stuff we've done already. Let's let's move on to the next point because we're probably running a little longer. Where are we here? We've talked about all the characters. We've talked about the culture. Um. We talked about the gray. We've talked about a lot of the themes, you know, the choice, the other things, the butterfly effect. Oh, here's here's an interesting point that I noticed because you remember like the big contest throughout the game, the everyday heroes um, contest. Do you remember like, when you got to the art gallery? Do you remember seeing all the other pictures? There are pictures of like grave keepers, firefighters, like hospice care, right. and Max photos one because of the picture of her staring at a wall of her own pictures. 
I always thought that was a little weird. But then I got to think about it. In the space of this game, because of all these pictures, Max was able to go through and save and help people, thus being, you know, that kind of everyday hero. So it makes I, sense in a meta context. But yeah, I, also weird I think in the, the internal context, context think about context. it, all those other photos are of singular everyday heroes in a singular position. Max takes a p- picture of herself containing all of her in front other of work all. as a documentarian. Which is probably yeah. why the photography teacher, being a huge uh, psycho douchebag, wanted to pick it. You know, and then he burns your journal when he gets when you tear it out because he like because he gets mad. Should just turn Did the you actually look? Out. Fun fact: um, If you try to look at the journal after he's burned it, it is indeed burned. Oh yeah, no, I accidentally hit the button. I'm like, oh yeah, it's burned. Duh. <laughs> it's like hmm. So, yeah, there's but... a, there a lot of photography and like art talk in this game, a lot of which went over my I, I I learned a few things, you know, like Golden Hour. It's like, I did not know that. That's how I'm forever going to refer to um, Sunset and Sunrise as. Yeah, that's it. going to also start calling the sun start calling the sun a space heater because I think that's punny and great. Yeah. Oh yeah, wasn't that nice? All the achievement names were uh, specific photography terms. Yeah, yeah they were. And I'm, like, I'm like, and I understood like a None of them. Yeah, no. I'm bad at photography. Oh, yeah. Outside genetic, of my, my mom's also terrible at photography, so I have never learned to photograph good. My dad's of the school of where you like you take enough pictures, you find one that you like. I don't have time for that. <laughs> but, I, yeah, a lot of the photography stuff, like, I took two semesters of humanities, and all I got out of it in this game was I understood what they meant when they said chiaroscuro. And, like, I could understand concepts of, like, realism and modernism and that kind of stuff. Uh, so yeah, we don't really have a lot to talk about the art element. Yeah, we don't have that kind of background, but I think I it's mean, interesting that they chose photography as a medium for this. Because I like it. Yeah, it's yeah. interesting because what was yeah, the, Max, there was a quote because it's, it's all about it, like um, capturing a moment in yeah. time. Right. That's what I was gonna say. If you did, but also love... it's good because well, one you know. With cell phone cameras, like Victoria's always using, you know, there's a there's an instantness and a readily available to cameras. But even so, Max with her retro, she still has an instant camera. So there's a there's a certain immediacy to the art. Like if it was about painting, it would take forever. You know, if it was about sketching, you'd have to pause and do a montage if you're sketching something. If it was about pottery, she'd have to spend the time on the wheel and the kiln and all that. Photography is print it out, shake it. It's done. But yeah, so that's an interesting element. Um, Plus, I don't know if you could use a ceramic pot as a focus for jumping time. So it's kind of uh, like... Maybe, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> if maybe it was like, like you... Carmen San Diego level <laughs> stuff. <laughs> Alright, I'm going to go back to the Greek era. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Where in the world is oh, this? Oh, man. Advanced time fuckery. I know, okay, so I'm going to go back to the characters here because I feel like there is a character that we kind of glossed over who I thought was, well, who wasn't important, you know, still made kind of a big impact on me. And I'm, of course, talking about my boy Samuel. Mm-hmm. Motherfucking, like, third eye seeing in tune with nature, friend of the squirrels, weird, X-Files weird. Yeah, he, clearly, he clearly fits that archetype of the weird mystic. Right, you think he's just the weird creepy gender, but then he turns out he's just the weird perceptive guy. Like, you think at first he'd be an oddball, but the more you talk to him, it's like, oh, Samuel actually knows kind of what the fuck's going on around here. I mean, like, he can't articulate it to you, but he totally realizes there's big shit coming. It's around Max, you know, that kind of stuff. Plus, he's pretty chill. He admits (laughs) that spirit animal's a squirrel. I know, and, like, if squirrels squirrels like a person, how bad could he be? I mean, really. Yeah. And then he professes that your spirit animal is the doe, which you see everywhere. You see its symbol in the graffiti in the in the bathroom. It's following you around. It can't be photographed. It's transparent. It leads you to Rachel Amber's grave, or presides over it. That kind of thing. Maybe the doe is Rachel Amber. That's a that's a theory people like to float. Oh really? Yeah, ghost Amber. You know. Yeah, it's. It's well, and there, the game makes a huge deal of out of comparing 
Max to Rachel. Rachel went to the school. You know, there's a point where you dress in Rachel's clothes and some people have a hard time recognizing that you're not Rachel. Which I find very strange. <laughs> That's yeah. kind of a kind of a magical realism. In the um in the nightmare, there's a sequence in the dorms where you where the game acts like it's while Rachel Amber's at school and stuff, but you're just Max dressed in Rachel's clothes again. But when you become Victoria in the nightmare, you become Victoria. I'm Victoria. Yeah, I remember oh, that. Because... Now, part of I don't that know, maybe it's like symbolism, like, like Max model. is trying, like, Max is trying to take Rachel's place. Max oh, yeah, is definitely feeling jealous of Rachel and all the time she spent with Chloe. Or more, maybe more simply, she just uh, can't visualize Rachel as well as she can Victoria, having never met her. Oh, that sounds good. I mean, never seen her outside of a photo, so... Uh, yeah. Yeah. And don't even see her corpse. Ugh. Nope. So I think there's one thing I wanted to I wanted to touch on, I think, before we do any of our other, like, jokey touching points. There's a lot of psychology in this game, I think, especially oh, in the last act. Um, you do the nightmare sequence, where it's kind of ambiguous what exactly is going on, but I would say that it was very Jungian in psychology terms. Max is constantly bombarded by her her repressed self-doubt and anxieties and all that stuff that she doesn't talk about openly, and then it just all bubbles up, and she literally confronts a cynical version of herself who calls into question everything that she believes. So she basically faces her own shadow kind of thing. I kind of I wish they actually made a bigger deal out of that. Like... See if Max had come to some sort of like resolution or become broken from talking to herself, because that scene kind of just goes on by itself. You don't. I don't. I never really got a sense of like I beating. Think so, that, yeah, that part of that issue is that you still have to resolve for yourself because right after that, like I said, there's the Chloe montage and then there's the big final choice. So what do you do? That's what I think the game is setting up with that introspection. It confronts you with all of Max's self doubt and the self doubt the player should have because this is just after Horn literally grabs you by the shoulders and says, it's all your fault, Max. You know, the game is reinforcing issues of self-doubt and other stuff to, like, make you think, oh, gee, was it really the right thing to go back in time all this time and do all this stuff? And then the game is like, but remember, here's what you got out of it, and hopefully, if like, in my playthrough, and you can actually watch this on a channel, there's me going down the line of all the positive experiences with Chloe, you know, dancing, walking in the train tracks, holding hands, the kiss, her saving you in the truck a couple times, stuff like that. I liked it. It was kind of like a super deep dive version of all those times she sat on park benches and whatnot yeah. and thought about her life. I think it's a good element. I want to say that from, there were a couple, like, from a technical standpoint, there were a couple issues I had with the game. One, the, I think the HUD work could have used a little work. Like, there were points where, you could very easily not see interactables. Uh, right. Yeah, you had to get your nosy on to like the maximum there. Which is, is very maybe that hard. Was cool. I think it's like like I had I struggled for several minutes in the storm section with the fire because I was like, okay, I have no idea what I'm looking for. And then Max says, Oh, I need somebody to stop this fire. I'm like, but what? And then you need the sand, but to find the sand and you have to get like right up on it and look down at it. And actually, there's no um, other indication that you can interact with this before that. I think there, it's actually a bug, particularly that one. You had to let it explode first before you could actually. I had to let it go all the way. Up. Okay. Yeah. That's, I think I that also is a bit of a bad like game design effect. Like if you can see the solution before it something goes completely wrong, you should still do it. But yeah, I can see. That. Yeah, no, I don't think it was deliberate. It was um, it was just unintended. It sucks. I know. Oh man, like. Speaking of, like, unintended things, I remember specifically during the storm, like, I felt so bad, like, legit, like, anxiety and depression when they're going through the building and you have to turn on the sprinkler system, mm -hmm. and you turn on the sprinkler system and you electrocute that guy, and I was like, oh! And you have to no! do it. You, you have to do it. There unless you do it. Yeah, so this is one of those moments of, oh, shit. That was pretty dark. <laughs> yeah, it was. And I'm like, no, I must save him. One of the darkest like, things then, the other and thing like, I want to talk about, like, design-wise, is is it just me, or did it feel kind of like the last episode was a little padded weirdly, and yet didn't uh, explain on some points? Like, yeah, this is, like there's a giant stealth section in the Nightmare, 
that just goes on and like, oh, jeez, yeah, okay, come on, game. It was still section was super unnecessary. And then you have to find Polly. Like, like honestly, I found that entire that entire section where you have to like run between like very hard and difficult because at some points you would they they would all converge and I have to keep rewinding and move like three feet. Yeah, no. And then rewind I, again. Once again, <laughs> if you like, watch me do it, you can constantly watch me be like, all right, I'm just gonna. I'm gonna rewind. I'm gonna go foot. I'm gonna rewind. I'm gonna go walk a foot until I'm just out of your way. And you can just, just brute force. I mean, yeah. it's pretty. You can, but that's a, it's annoying that. and it's a little. It's troublesome. It's like why did you do no, that? Especially that's, considering that's definitely the, why it's annoying. The the save Chloe ending. Now, obviously, there's it has to be a little ambiguous because otherwise you say too much. But it's very short. Like you. Yeah, it. it is. There's an ending yeah. that rolls and then it's done. It is, you know, I still haven't seen it yet because I haven't gone back and done, like, collectibles and stuff, which I will. But it's my understanding that the ending where you choose not to save Chloe and save Arcadia Bay is much longer and more expanded. Oh, yeah. yeah oh, yeah. Very there are fields. It's, there it's, are it's fields. Pretty, a lot of fields. There's also like a lot that. of, like, dicking around in multiple timelines in, like, San Francisco and stuff and jumping back and forth to photographs, in photographs and that kind of thing. What was which, that? Which, I was saying how there's... In the final episode, there's a little bit of dicking around like San Francisco and like jumping in photographs, in photographs and stuff. Some of which oh, could yeah. have been made more simple. I get that they're trying to like do new set pieces and stuff, but yeah, it's, it seems a little. It did seem a little padded. Like you know what the conclusion is, we know what the conclusion is. We can't have you get to the conclusion too soon. Yeah, I guess they're trying to showcase Max's desperation in the situation. Sure. Oh, it's so, like how, be- like how far is she willing to go? To like unfuck, like I uh, use air quotes here, unbuckle the situation, right? Because yeah. there's a lot. Of that. Yeah, I think that sequence. Was and then it comes good. down to the choose it, <laughs> and I guess it comes, again, it comes down to those two choices of you can unfuckle the situation or you can just leave it buckled. You can accept that you've done fucked up, and you can yep. deal with it. And lots of other people have to deal with it too. Yep. Anyway, so let's uh, let's wrap this up, and so I'm gonna put it out there. Um, let's go on a grading scale of five stars. And what would you rate the game? I can go first. Ron, what would you give it out of five? Give it to Ron. That's, uh, that's a good question. You know, yeah. three to four Kates. Three to four Kates. Okay, Kate marshes our scale. So save uh, three to four Kates out of five. Yeah, let's do that. Three point five Kates. Uh, I'm going to go full on this. I'm going to say uh, four out of five Kates. Yeah, um... I'm it's actually going to go... It's a fiver, but it's pretty good. I was like, I'm going to go... Like, I'm going to go with three Kates out of five myself. As I said, I've been playing a lot of, like, these kind of games, like, you know, from Telltale. And while it definitely, like, you know, hit some spots, I just feel like the storytelling could have been a bit better myself. Okay. And it's like, didn't quite hit me quite in the feels, like, as much... As some other ones go, but you know, still good, still like, you know, you know I'm, I'm gonna be nice. I'll give it a three point five k. We got half a k. Three point five, soft four, and numbers, right? Numbers. I mean, if you're rounding, it rounds up to four. But so I'll say, yeah. So I'll give it an above average k. Personally, this is why if you're actually using a ten point scale and it's not. A four point scale that pretends to be a ten point scale. I think ten point scale is better because you can get some granularity. Because I would say that it's a seven out of ten. All right, well, me, <laughs> like it's let, definitely let above average, but it's not you know maximal tier. I give it a thumbs up, which means I think I'd I'd let my friends play this. <laughs> yes, this is why we played it. Yeah, because you were like, "Holy shit, guys, you got to play it!" And then Lucky was like, "Oh, it's gonna be free uh, the next month." And I was like, "Oh yeah, I'm all over that. I need a new thing to play anyway because I beat Persona Five again." I will say and, I did not expect to like this as much as I did. So that did was you right. even say you never saw it coming? I never saw. No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Play the outro. I'm not gonna <laughs> play the outro. That's gonna give me a super copyright strike. Just consider it yourself. <laughs> I'll put you yeah, never yeah. see it coming in the tags. It'll be linked there. All right. Uh, yeah. So I think that's a good wrapping up point. We're thinking maybe if we do another one of these in the not-too-distant future, we're going to try Shadowrun Hong Kong is our next idea. We're not dead certain on that. Uh, I'm okay with that because I need to play it anyway. So it's fine if we don't get back into that. So, uh, Any other final thoughts for the internet? 
Um, final thoughts on the internet. If you have not played Life is Strange, as I said, right now it is free on PlayStation Plus for the month of June. You probably got it for maybe a couple more weeks. So if you haven't, get it, play it, try it, love it. Also, if you haven't played it and you're listening to this, what the hell? Yeah, why are you here? <laughs> we ruined the whole thing. We literally yeah. gave all of it away. They're vicariously making our judgments. Yeah. But um, other than that, uh, no, this was fun. It's like we should definitely do this more often. Maybe, see, you know, yeah, find something. Good times. I love it. Okay. Yeah. Ron, final thoughts? Nothing. Okay. I think that's summed it up. All right. Well, Internet, if you like this video, please give it a like. If you have any comments, please leave them in the section down below. And if you want to see more videos like this, please subscribe. Thank you.